Hello, this is now my third video in the series on the psychological humanities. Let us turn to another article by Thomas Thiel, published in 2020, titled Theorizing in Psychology, From the Critique of a Hyperscience to Conceptualizing Subjectivity, which was published in Theory and Psychology. This article addresses the question, what are the tasks of theory? What are the aims of theoretical psychology? It's always tempting to summarize an author's work based on the structure that they themselves provide in the work. If an author, for example, divides their article into three parts or five parts, the easiest and most natural thing to do for someone like me who wants to discuss that work is to structure the overview, the summary, according to the same three or five parts. In this case, I'm going to begin by doing that. I'm going to begin with Theo's own three-part division. He divides, we could say he divides the article based on the three tasks that he's considering for theoretical psychology. But I'm also going to organize the three parts within one framework. I will also use a couple of examples to illustrate the distinctions, and then I will express my skepticism about one of the three parts that Theo has proposed. And I think the main contribution that I can provide here is the use of examples. Examples are really crucial. And one of the features of Theo's writing that makes it difficult and dry is that he very rarely relies on examples. So let's see. Theo considers three aims for theory, including theoretical psychology. These three are, number one, critique, number two, reconstruction, number three, creation. So critique, reconstruction, and creation. Three dimensions, three styles of theory, engaging with theory. I would like to propose reformulating these in a way that they all fit together within one frame, one framework. So, reformulating these, talking about them in terms of relations, kinds of relations, and how we respond to those relations. Relations could be existent or non-existent, and they could be apparent or hidden relations. I'll get to examples shortly. At the beginning of the article, he writes that scholarly theories in psychology resemble how we use theory in everyday life. This is an extremely important point, that Theoretical psychology theory in its scholarly form is a modified and revised and maybe elaborated, more developed version of something that we are already capable of. We already do some kind of theory, theoretical work in our everyday life. So when we talk about theory, we should be able to mention, include a few things, a few examples in our discussion, such that for people who are not familiar with this field, they find it relatable. They can recognize, oh yeah, I do that. Sometimes I think in that way. So. Although Thiel mentions that resemblance, that uh, scholarly theories in psychology resemble how we use theory in everyday life, but he doesn't get into that resemblance. He doesn't flesh out instances of that resemblance. What I will do here is to discuss the three styles of theorizing, critique, reconstruction, and creation, first with reference to everyday examples. So that's how I'm going to begin. We can find easy examples in the occasional mismatch between what people say and what they do. So relationship, remember I'm talking about all those three tasks of theory in terms of relationships. One way we can pay attention to relationships is the relationship between what somebody says, the way they talk, and what they actually do, the, the potential mismatch between uh, speech and action. Imagine someone who talks nonstop about how much they love their family, but doesn't spend much time with their family or someone who talks about how much they love reading, but they don't actually read if you look at their day-to-day -day behavior. Or someone who talks about being fair to other people, being just and being open-minded, but they don't act on the basis of these values. They don't enact the things that they talk about. Here in each case, what we find is a non-existent relation, or more precisely, a claimed or promised or expected relation that isn't there. If we inspect that relationship, it's not really there. It's a non-existent relationship. Since it is reasonable to expect the relation of consistency, it is in, this, in these cases, it is reasonable to expect people to be consistent. It's reasonable to expect consistency between how someone talks and what they do, some measure of consistency. And it, it would be, I should add here, uh, an ethical point, a moral point, that even if most people demonstrate hypocrisy or a mismatch between these two, what they say and what they do, 
it is still reasonable to criticize instances where there is inconsistency. So that's just a, um, one form of relation. This would be the first task of theory. So the first type of task, looking at a relationship that would be reasonable to expect it to be there, but it is actually not there. An apparent relationship that is non-existent upon further inspection. The most popular and widely accepted forms of critique in psychology, current forms of critique in psychology, also happens to be the most simplistic form. It is not about relationships between different levels of the research process, inconsistency or lack of relationship between data, theories, phenomena, but it's about phenomena over time. It's basically a relationship between phenomena and itself, the, the persistence of phenomena over time. In other words, it is about replicability. This is a very simplistic, almost the most simplistic way of criticizing psychology, and it happens to be also the most dominant way. If psychologists ever engage in criticism, critique, this is the most likely way of uh, criticism that they would engage in. In addition to cri uh, critique, which points out defective relations or non-existent relations, we can trace genuine and existing relations that are hidden from view. For example, we can ask, why did that person insist that they love their family? So in the previous example that I mentioned, why was there a mismatch? Why did they have to insist that they love their family, they insist on proclaiming that love and affection? We might investigate and come to the conclusion that what that person wants to do with such statements isn't a proclamation of love, but they want to fit into a, a set of cultural norms. That's why they are expressing their affection for family because they want to fit into a desirable cultural category. They want to live up to a cultural norm. So we, we, we trace the relationship, we discover a relationship between the desire to fit into a cultural norm, to, to fulfill a cultural norm, and the expression of love for family. So in that example, they want to construct an image of themselves that is of someone who loves their family. Similarly, a person might wish to create an image of themselves as a fair and open-minded person and be interested in that image more than the practice of fairness and open-mindedness. So a person is more interested, this is, we can think about examples of this, a person is more interested in creating a positive image of themselves more so than being embodiment of those positive attributes. When we find relations like this, we are accounting for observations with the help of facts that are relatively less obvious. It's an observable fact that someone enrolls in a college program, for example, but it is less, easy, less relatively less obvious that they are pursuing a college degree in order to please their parents. So once we realize the relationship between the desire to please their parents and their decision to enroll in a college program, that is a connection that was not initially obvious but we pointed, pointed it out, we make it apparent. So we covered so far in everyday examples, we covered critique and reconstruction. The third task of theory is creative. We can reformulate this in terms of creating new relations that didn't exist before. Would it be, for example, sensible to see creativity in the decision to become someone's friend or the decision to introduce two people who are initially strangers? I'm here, I'm reminded of the book Social Chemistry by Marissa King. In that book, she talks about creating connections among people, among groups, among networks, as a creative act and as something that can serve as the basis of further acts of creativity. Another example, when you decide to use your knowledge of statistics, for example, or your knowledge of philosophy in a new field, say politics, that is an instance of creativity because you're creating a connection that didn't exist previously. So with that preliminary understanding of the three tasks, let's move to psychology. How can these three tasks show up in psychological research? Critique shows up every time we detect mismatch between how a piece of research presents itself and what it actually does, what it actually can accomplish. It's promise versus it's delivery. So there's, there are lots of mismatches. If you, if you have time and interest, you can, this is an attitude you can adopt to investigate. My book, Experimental Psychology and Human Agency, is filled with examples of research that claims to investigate an aspect of human agency and showing that, in fact, it is doing something something else, altogether something else. 
Oftentimes, that something else is so trivial that the researchers themselves would never admit to it. So one path for theory is to look at research and ask, what does it claim to be doing? And what is it, what is it actually doing? So that claim of what is it going to accomplish, the promise. The promise is not accidentally bigger than its actual accomplishment because the promise is part of its justification. Where does the research take its motivation from? Again, the examples that are relatively fresh in my mind, the claims that a re piece of research is about free choice, about how we, whether or not we are capable of free choice, free will, uh, whether or not we can break rules and break norms and with how we are capable of daydreaming and how daydreaming might be related to creativity. These claims that a piece of research is pursuing and understanding in any of those domains means that the research is motivated, justified, and funded because it is about those things, because it is making those promises. But if you look closely with a disinterested perspective, from a disinterested perspective, you realize that it is not about those things. Next, we can reveal hidden relationships, reconstruction. We can, for example, look at psychology's happiness industry or productivity industry or self-help industry and ask whether it is connected to, whether that industry is connected to some other extra social, cultural, and economic forces and organizations. We can point to personality constructs and measures of personality or other constructs like in measures of anxiety and depression and the construct itself, how it is defined, how it is defined as a problem and how solutions to it are proposed and see how these constructs are motivated by the desire to optimize human performance in a way that serves the currently dominant conceptions of work and productivity. The ideal person we should ask when we look at these constructs, when we look at these psychological discourses, discussions, we can always ask, what is the ideal person that they have in mind? The ideal person within our current systems is one who doesn't experience anxiety or depression. And when they do, they will fix it on their own. They can, they can fix it. They should. They're expected to fix it by themselves. Seek the solution mm -hmm. to the psychological problems internally. We can look at the self-help industry as a means of deflecting attention from social political injustices and maintaining attention on the individual. You are responsible. You should work harder. You should try to be happier using affirmations and all of those techniques. Reconstructive theory would involve noticing the psychologization or inappropriate at many times, maybe not all the time, but occasionally inappropriate psychologization of every aspect of human life. Everything is psychologized, including politics, religion, work, art. There's a scale for everything. If you want to know, this is a very silly example, but unfortunately it's a, it's a fact. If you want to know your political orientation, your political attitudes, you can take a test. You can fill a questionnaire and at the end, the researcher or some automated online program will tell you what kind of political orientation you have. The, the, the claim is that we will tell you, you don't need to understand the political landscape. You don't need to look at society, look, in, look at the world and participate in the political order. Think, think through issues and come to a position, a political position. Psychology makes this extremely silly promise that our politics, our religion, artistic creativity could be found inside us as opposed to in our actions and interactions, in our participation in social and cult cultural orders. This is why it makes sense to see psychology as a discipline that wants to adjust people, fix people, uh, fix using quotation marks, keeping people, keeping us subservient to existing systems of power and control, and in doing that, protecting those systems, protecting the status quo. Sometimes critique and reconstruction can be done at the same time. They can go hand in hand. One example is my own discussion of a, an article by Dario Krapan. It was called, a, part of the title of the article was A Quest for Disconnected Psychology. The article was presented as a radical new idea. And in discussing that article in a previous video on the channel, I showed that while he was proposing something that seemed radical, seemed new, it was in fact completely consistent with the status quo. So my discussion of that article involved both critique and the reconstruction, because I had to connect it to the current, current status quo and kind of dismantle some of its own claims, some of its promise from its delivery. Now, back to Thomas Thiel's article. The conclusion that psychology is a so-called hyperscience similarly results from a combination of critique and reconstruction. What is a hyperscience? 
A hyperscience is a kind of enterprise that denies its own historicity. It denies, uh, it, it claims its own naturalness. So it, it denies its contingent features that result from culture, society, uh, economy, and politics. A hyperscience doesn't want to be associated with any kind of accident, any kind of, it doesn't want to be a cultural product or a societal achievement that could have been otherwise. To understand the hyperscience better, let me bring two additional analogies. The first analogy would be a hyper-romantic couple. So you can think about a couple that is hyper-romantic. Such a couple, when they are in public, they treat each other with excessive affection and they demonstrate overt signs of romance to an unusual degree. So you might have met, you might have seen romantic couples like this, couples who are excessively romantic and affectionate in public, but their overt signs of affection is an overcompensation. The hyper romance is masking the fact that they have conflicts, that they are insecure and probably masking the absence of true romance in their relationship. A second analogy is relatable to teachers, educators. This is the hyper-responsible student who comes to your office, usually a couple of days before a deadline, who comes to your office with, this, with a stack of books and papers, and the student is showing all the overt signs of hard work and responsibility. They, sh they tell you probably that they haven't slept for a night or two, but this is trying to hide and mask the fact that the student hasn't done much work on the assignment, and maybe they have just started to work. So the management of overt signs, external signs, are controlled in order to present an image that contradicts the underlying reality, which in the case of a student is a lack of responsibility. In the case of a hyper-romantic couple, is a lack of true love and romance. Now, about hyper-science. Taylor writes, quote, drawing on Baudrillard's 1988 ideas, I suggest that a hyper-science uses ideals and material techniques to alight the fact that it is not a natural science, inflates and complicates its methodological activities in order to conceal the temporality and contextuality of psychological phenomena, and incessantly refers to itself as a science in order to make up for its lack of substance and content." End quote. This is, I think, extremely familiar to those of us who have been engaged in the psychological research, the kind of psychological research that wants to be a natural science. Two pages later, Thiel writes, quote, psychology's success can be attributed to supporting an existing economic system, whereas psychologists have remained rather silent on the psycho psychosocial impact of increasing income and wealth inequality on human mental life, end quote. That is a, a, hidden, a hidden relationship that could be brought to focus with reconstructive theory. Aside from critique and reconstruction, Thiel argues that theoretical psychology can be creative too, or it should aim to be creative as well. I said already that creative theory makes relations that didn't exist before, don't currently exist. That could mean any number of things. It could mean new frameworks for interpreting phenomena, new styles of reasoning, bringing known phenomena under the scope of existing theories in a way that is novel, or discovering new phenomena. I am, in general, skeptical that creative theorizing can ever be an aim, an explicit aim in itself. So you start your work and say, okay, I want to create something original. I'm skeptical that that is possible, it's a worthwhile attitude. I am especially skeptical about the style of theorizing that Theo has been discussing under the heading theory of subjectivity. I don't think in its current form it can accomplish anything. It is essentially a list so if the theory of subjectivity, the, the form that it takes in Theo's work, it sounds something like this. So he goes on through a list and says, a theory of subjectivity which we want should include society. It should include culture. It should include history and historicity. It should include the body and embodiment of the subject. It should include genetics and neuroscience. So this is, I may be wrong, but this sounds like a shopping list. What I mean is that it might be unreasonable to expect anything, any progress to come out of this. We cannot expect to put in all the elements of a good theory in a box and then shake the box and see the theory magically come out of the box. Part of my skepticism has to do with the insistence on inclusivity. So a list of all the things that we should include, it should 
not leave anything out. That actually, I think, is that's a feature that hinders theoretical progress. Everything, if you say everything has to be included, then there's no risk, there's no tension. There, there would be no dialectical movement. Without the risk, there is no creation. Good examples of creative theoretical psychology, to my mind, have been risky. They have involved considering standards that would exclude, not only include, they would exclude things that are, according to that standard, bad instances of research. Think, for example, about Amadeo Giorgi's project of phenomenological psychology. It excludes a lot. It begins with a, with a very bold claim that psychology is about experience, subjective experience. Think about Jan Smetland's insistence that on the role of psychological common sense. Again, it's drastic, risky, and it excludes. Or think about Jan Balziner's seemingly outrageous claim, which I happen to agree with, the outrageous claim that we don't need new data in psychology. This is creation. It is creation, creative, because it is bold. Or on the other hand, I would say people who argued for neuroscience and neuroscientific reduction, reductionism, were also creative, according to my current criteria of boldness, risk, and exclusion. They started something. They started something that was exciting, at least for a while. We happen to disagree with them. I think they're wrong. But they were bold, and they created tension. They took risks. They still take risks. They, they can be defeated with arguments, and they, they think that their success is because they, they have good arguments, but they are wrong about that. Their success is owed to factors beyond you know, extra scientific factors. Although they take the credit for it, they, don't, they, they deny that their success is owed more to factors such as technological and methodological fetishism, but returning to my point, creative theorizing has to, has to be directed and has to, be, has to have clear aims. And I think the general theory of subjectivity in the form that Theo has been endorsing lacks both focus and force. But I might be proven wrong, and that would be a good thing. I'm not sure. To wrap up, I try to reformulate Theo's three tasks in terms of relations. Here's a diagram that might be helpful. We work with relations that are either apparent or hidden existent or in non-existent. In the case of existent and apparent relations, theoretical work doesn't seem necessary. So that's, um, we don't discuss that. In the case of existent and hidden relations, what would be useful is reconstructive theory. We reconstruct and we reveal hidden relations that already exist. With apparent non-existent relations, what is needed is critique. So they are apparent, these apparent relations like a false promises that don't really deliver. And finally, with non-existent and hidden relations, what, is, what could be done is creativity. But this creativity has to be accompanied, in my view, with risk and taking responsibility. I remember that claim in George Saunders' discussion of Russian short stories, 19th century Russian short stories, that the essence of an artist is taking responsibility. I think the same applies taking responsibility in uh, good theoretical psychology. It requires boldness and some type of unavoidable exclusion, which is another way of saying it requires being selective. If you like further reading on these themes, I would recommend my own short commentary. It's only two, three pages long. It's a short commentary titled Phenomenology as Critique, Discovery, and Justification. And Fiona Hebert's work on the metaphysical basis of a process psychology, that's where I take my the logic of relationships, logic of relations from. And I would, I would recommend that article as well. Thank you for your attention. Please comment if you like, and don't hesitate to be critical, even ruthless. I will speak with you in the next video.